So, hello and welcome. I'm, I'm Ginger Bill, and today I'm giving a presentation of an introduction to the Odin programming language, of which I am the creator. So, let's start off with a bit of a background around the language myself. So, what is Odin? Um, well, the Odin programming language is a, is a language that's been designed with the intent of creating an alternative to C with the following goals of simplicity, high, built for high-performance machines and modern systems, and the joy of programming. I'll explain what these mean a bit later on, uh, but these are kind of the main goals that I was designing around. So, let's start with the obligatory hello world to begin off with. So this is it. This is the hello world in Odin using the font package. So in Odin, all files have a package declaration at the top. So in this case, it says package main. And uh, then you have an import statement here that says import core font. So this is importing the font package from the core library collection. And then you have the main procedure, which is the entry point to your program. Again, similar to C. And then all I'm doing is printing the line that says hello. And then that says world in Japanese, which I think is Sekai. So hello world. And it's just showing off that um, Odin supports Unicode and UTF-8 by default. So why a new language? Um, well, the main reason is most languages out there at the moment, even especially the new ones, aren't really built for high performance nor modern systems. Uh, they're not taking con um, control over memory layout or memory allocations that much. And I would wanting this for myself for many different languages and try and get as expressive as possible in those cases. I also wanted a language that was simple. Um, I, I like the simplicity of many small like languages that still are very versatile. But the problem is, again, many languages are trying to be more complicated nowadays, and languages like C++ are extremely complicated. And I, I'm kind of missing the zap simplicity route being missed. I also want a language that's enjoyable to program in. I'm programming most of the days, and I don't want to be really annoyed when I'm programming. I want something that's enjoyable to use. I also want a fast development cycle. I want something that compiles extremely fast. I don't have to wait sometimes a very long, long time for things to compile. If you use C++, it, it can take a while. And also, it's a cool name. O Odin's a pretty cool name. Who doesn't like Norse mythology? It's pretty good. So just the general history behind language. So the language is about just over four years old now, when I, well, when I first started it, at least. And um, it came about from the annoyance of programming in C++ every day. And one evening I just went, oh, just screw it. I'm going to make my own. So it be, again, it began as a Pascal clone, and uh, even with all the begin and end and everything in there, but it quickly evolved into something else. Um, the language itself has got he amount of heavily influenced from many of the languages such as Pascal, C, Go, Oberon, and many other languages, by the way, and all just learn from it. Um, as some people know about me, I'm, some of my programming idols are Niklaus Viet or an English uh, Nicholas Worth. Um, and Rob Pike as well. And these have been some kind of the my design gurus I've been looking for when designing languages. And from those two people, simplicity has been my driving force of design. But again, as I found very early on, very within the first few weeks, simplicity is really complicated, like really complicated design. And I had to go through many different revisions, experimentation, and finding out what was optimal for increasing my productivity. And it found out increasing the productivity of others as well who are using the language. So some of the guiding principles of design have been, again, simplicity and readability. Um, readability because most of the time you are reading code, not writing it. So you want it to be readable, simple to comprehend, and simple to understand what is going on. You don't want it to be so terse it is incomprehensible and so verbose that you, don't know what, you can't see where you are. Um, another guiding principle was being minimal as in there ought to be only one way to write something. And if there is another way, there should be a really good reason for it. Um, sometimes there is, and you have to break that rule. None of these rules are very hard. There are sometimes you have to break them. Another one is the striving for orthogonality. So an orthogonality is the idea that concepts kind of orthogonal to others um, or at right angles, they don't affect each other. You can build upon them. So if you have orthogonal concepts and components, you can attach to them and understand how they how would they behave when they interact with each other for more likely. Sometimes you got, can't get pure orthogonality, but striving for it is very useful, which leads to the second, the other principle, which is the principle of least surprise, which is People have been programming a long time now and um, over the past, say, 50, 60 years, and people have gotten used to certain how things work. 
And sometimes you don't want to break that unless you've got really good reason to break it. So you want to take those intuitions and instincts that people have built and try and lean into them and say, okay, this is how people expect it. There may be a good reason for it. Another thing to understand is that programs, um, is that our programs are fundamentally about transforming data and other forms of data. So this means that your programming language is expressing the code of algorithms. It's not worrying about type, it's not type systems or anything like that, or the fancier things on high, more high level. And it's, it's about how do I express the algorithms in the best way that I can for the platform and the machine that I'm writing on. Another guiding principle is that when designing a language, th there is a lot of embedded knowledge and wisdom in older programming languages. Take C, for instance. C has it's been very successful. There's something about it that is very good. But there's also a lot of mistakes in it. There's a lot of bad design decisions. So I need to learn from those mistakes, but also don't forget that there's so much good in there. And finally, another guiding principle was making sure that sim it related to the simplicity argument that the language is simple enough and small enough that I can memorize the entire specification. Um, C, I, I have, I, you could easily do. Um, I have done Go, I've memorized Go before, I've memorized older versions of Python before, but certain languages like C++, I don't think there's a single soul on this planet who can know the entire C++ specification. Um, and even some modern, more modern languages like Rust, I don't think people even know that. Uh, again, it's something that sometimes languages get very complicated and you don't know it. So when I'm designing this language, I had to say, okay, I'm going to respect the program. I'm going to trust them to write down what they actually meant. And I'm going to trust the programmer's intentions for the program. This means I'm not going to handhold the program. I am not trying to be enforce an idea of what how I think you should be programming exactly or enforce an idea of safety or correctness. If you want to blow off your own foot, you can. But Interestingly, uh, go, uh, this language has so many nice constructs in it in Odin that it's hell of a lot safer than C and stuff. And so even safer than C++ and so many other languages that it's not actually as easy to blow your foot off as you think, and nor can you do it accidentally. So talking about one of the points I said at the beginning was high performance. Um, people seem to not understand that computers today are extremely fast machines. In fact, they're so fast, we don't even realize how fast they are, most people. And we don't take advantage of them. Uh, programs don't nor do languages. And it's kind of, we're still stuck in the days of we're thinking we're programming for a PDP-7. Computers nowadays have loads of cores, loads of threads. We have virtualized memory. We have 30-bit, or even now most likely 64-bit address spaces. We have um, different levels of cache, L1, L2, L3. We have um, more loads of registers, even extra wide registers like SIMD. There's so much that we are not optimizing for with our language design to take advantage of these different parts of the system. So because of that, Odin is a statically typed language. That means it cannot be, I wasn't gonna go for dynamic. I wasn't going to be an interpreted language. No, I need to take advantage of the, the high performance of these machines. It also means that Odin has to be a manual memory managed language. But Odin has an extensive support of custom allocators, which you can is, it takes utilizes the explicit context system, which I'll explain later, to ex take advantage of that to its, its extreme. So again, the other point I was talking about was the joy of programming. Again, the most the reason most of us go into programming is because it's fun. And again, there's many languages I use today, many of them much older languages, you get so frustrated to use them on a day-to-day -day basis because you're fighting decisions that were made for machines that don't even be used anymore or for things that were mistakes, but you're going to have to deal with them or things where there's loads of legacy things where other things rely upon certain behavior. And it just, it gets frustrated, frustrating for me and so many people. And the thing is even newer languages today, many of them still make you jump through hoops. Either they've got an idea of correctness and how you meant to program, or they've got an idea of safety, you have to do it this certain way, or a certain way of programming, or maybe it can let you do it another way, but you have to, it takes you a long while to get around all that issue. And it's just an absolute annoying. It doesn't, it doesn't allow you to express the problem in the way you want for the platform you want. Which is why when I was designing Odin, it, sometimes the design decision was, did it feel correct? And sometimes when it didn't feel correct, I had to experiment and figure out why? Because it's not obvious sometimes. There is this spirit of finesse. It's not always a mathematical formula as to why things work the way they do. You have to 
toy it out slowly. So let's start with the basics of the language itself. Um, when I designed Odin, um, and I'm still doing, is I, I kind of started from some of the basis of C and C++ and simplify those from those decisions. Again, this was informed from my experience of those languages and many other people as well, and understanding what goes on. And understanding that C got a lot right, but it also got a lot wrong. And getting rid of those things that it, I think got wrong or I don't like myself or whatever in general, change them as they go. So the first thing is a very small thing, but it, it actually plays an extremely important role in the rest of the language is Odin has no implicit numerical conversions. So it won't automatically convert between an int and a float or a Boolean and an int or anything like that. Um, and it's because C's arithmetic conversions are an absolute mess. And there's many bugs I have found where that's happened because of that. Yes, you can put loads of warnings on compilers, but even then, many people be, uh, rely upon that behavior, and it's not very good. Another one is Odin has pointers, but no pointer arithmetic. Now, I understand pointers are very, very important, but pointer arithmetic isn't so much. And it's even though you use it all the time in C and C++, it's actually rarely required if you have proper array types in the language and the semantics around those array types at all, because that's what you're trying to mimic a lot of the time with point arithmetic, is effectively you're just lacking proper array types. Now, sometimes you do need arithmetic, sometimes you do. So you can, you can use some generic procedures you know, built into the core library, or you can just use the uint point and just do the math yourself. And then the third thing I want to say, okay, is look, C's declarations, declaration syntax, which is meant to match its usage, um, and therefore, it means it's harder to parse into symbol table stuff. It's just insane to read. Like, here's an example I've got here. I had to write below what this actually is representing. This is declaring foo, this variable foo, as a pointer to a function which takes no parameters, returning a pointer to an array of three floats. And you read that and you look at yourself and you go, what? That's a, I don't understand that. Now, compare it to Odin's, you just read left to right. You go, declaring foo variable, which is a procedure that returns a pointer to three floats. Now that thing here, by the way, the, the C thing is I got it from the cdecl.org to actually put in, you can put in a C expression and it will tell you how to read it. Uh, but in general, I don't want to have to worry about this stuff when that sometimes I just want to express it. That's the signal. It's just as clear. So talking about the constants from the first point, um, in Odin, constants kind of just work. There's this um, idea that implicit constants, uh, there are implicit versions between constants because constants are very clever. They are kind of like ideal values. They have no size, no type, nor sinus or anything like that. So this means, unlike C, you do not need any suffixes. So you don't have to say it's unsigned or a long or an unsigned long or a long, long, long or whatever. Um, it's just a number or just a string or just a boolean, whatever. Just a, it's just a value. So here's some examples. Here's a decimal number, just a number. Here's an octal number. Here's a hexadecimal number. Here's a number that's two to the power of 100, just a number. The compiler doesn't care. Um, here's a floating point number. Here's a string. Here's a character literal, which we call runes in Odin. If the number it's going to be assigned to, so all constant viable, can assign to it, it will do. There is no need for conversions. So this solves actually a hell of a lot of problems, by the way, and it makes it feel absolutely wonderful. This took a long while to get right. Um, second thing is declarations. So when people use Odin the first time, if they're used to C, is they may think that this is backwards. And in fact, you've got the name first, then you've got the type. So this is kind of from the Pascal more aided tradition in this card. So in this, it's very simple to read, declaring a variable named A of type T. And on the next line, we've got declares Y and Z to be of type int. Yeah, good, great. In C, if you were declaring a pointer, it's because it's represented the usage. If we went int star A comma B, then A would be a pointer, but B isn't. But in Odin, it's very clear what's going on. You can also make assignments with these on your declarations, just using the equal sign, so very similar to C in that regard, and just do a normal assignment. Odin is also a multi-valued valued language, which means you can have multiple values on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side. So this is declaring X and Y with values of one and hello. But in fact, notice it actually infers the data type here. So it infers that X is going to be an integer and Y is going to be a string type. 
And notice I can do a reassignment, just make order the variables are declared in. And to show the actual behavior here is that the in inferredness is that you just drop out the type in the declaration and it will fur from the right hand side. The default type for an integer is an int. So it's going to default to an int. And there you go. So this makes sure many people see the colon equals. Just remember, it's actually two separate things and you can shove a type in between there. You can also do constant value declarations. And this is done by using a colon colon. So constant x in this case, because of how numbers work, uh, uh, or constants work, that what the x is untyped. It's just a string value has no type. It's similar to kind of, it works more like C's define rather than const in C. These are like true compile time constants. Um, it also means you can do computations at compile time with these variables through this basic compass. And lastly, one thing as well to mind is that with these multivariate expressions, uh, multivariate things, you can swap variables without having an explicit temporary. So you can just write sign yx to xy and then it'll just swap them for you. It's a nice little feature, but it just drops out of the type system magically. Another thing in Odin are packages. So pack, in Odin, uh, everything is made up of a package, and a package is just a directory containing Odin files. So when you import a package, you're importing a directory of Odin files. It's fine. In this example here, we're importing the Fumpt and OS package, which are both contained in the core library collection. The core library collection is a defined path to so where you can search up things. You can define your own library collections as well easily. If you want to have a different import name that's different to the path to that directory, you can set the name yourself. In this case, instead of Fumpt, we can call it foo. There you go, very simple. Now onto data types. Let's get over with all the basic data types. These are some of the most basic ones in Odin. We have Booleans, very simple. We have all the sized integer types. We have the sized float types. We have complex numbers and quaternions because why not? Quaternions were originally an April Fool's joke and then I went, eh, these are pretty useful, I'll keep them. Um, we also have like word sized integers which are the default integer types as well. These are register sized, which is int and uint. There's the uint pointer, which is for mainly for pointer calculations, an integer size pointer. There's raw pointer, which is um, equivalent, it's kind of equivalent to C void star, um, but it's because Odin doesn't have the concept of void. So it has a thing that all pointers can implicitly convert. This is one of the, one of the only rare, uh, rare implicit conversions in Odin. There's a rune type. So rune is a Unicode code point thing. It's 32 bit signed integer internally. Uh, it's distinct from an I32, by the way. And it's very useful for storing these in because Odin used to understand um, Unicode because modern languages nowadays you have to take care of them. Um, then you have a string. A string is effectively um, a pointer to a byte and also an integer. So these aren't null terminated strings. In, like in C, these are very, very useful strings. Uh, there are C strings, as you can see at the bottom there, which is when you were interfacing with foreign languages, such as C, very useful. Again, there's type ID and A there for the uh, runtime reflection stuff. There's an alias type, which is for byte, and also some sized booleans, which are very useful for interfacing with foreign languages. So as I said previously, Odin has pointers. And again, yeah, at the end of the day, a pointer is just a memory address of a value. And the the type of a pointer is a, is a caret in this case. We use a caret, which is a Pascal notation, um, caret t, and it's pointed to a type t value. And in Odin, we have the zero value of a pointer is nil. That's how, what we call the nil pointer. When you declare a pointer like that, it's just the same as that. It's, again, it's a pointer to int. So in this case here, we are then going to infer it from i equals one, two, three. And then we're going to assign it to a, get the address of it, which is the ampersand. So it's the same as c in this case to get the pointer. If you want to dereference a pointer, you put it on the right-hand side of the value. Um, so in this case, we're going to read th um, i through pointer p, and this one you're going to write to it. Now, again, as I said, this syntax comes from Pascal, but the, in C, it's you're using pointer, it matches the usage code, so it matches the, the type and the usage are the same. In Odin and Pascal, the type is on the left, the usage is on the right. So it's very clear, it's a nice balance going on. Odin has another thing is we have arrays. We have proper um, use for arrays. They're not just arrays that can demote to pointers like in um, C. We have three different types of arrays. We have fixed arrays, which are fixed size of memory, slices, which you can call array references maybe, and dynamic arrays. So a fixed array is very simple. This is declaring a, um, 
a compound literal of arrays here, and we're going to iterate across it and print them all. And if you want to get the length of an array, we just use the built-in procedure called len around the array, and it'll tell you this. In this case, it's a constant value because we know, we know it at compile time, so we say it's five. Simple. Fixed arrays are very simple. Oops. But one interesting thing about Anodin, which is exploiting how computers work, like modern computers, is we can now do array programming. So you can multiply two arrays together, and then they will multiply them at like any operations that the element type does, and they will add together like that. So in this case, it will be element-wise multiplication. Um, you can also, there's some shorthand stuff, which is very useful for when you're doing linear algebra in like um, one, two, three, or four dimensions. Um, so like a dot x times b dot y, if you already want, it's very useful. And you can also do swizzle operations. So you can swizzle all the different things and you get a new data type at the end. Very useful when you're doing loads of linear algebra. And also there's hardware support for swizzles. The next data type are slices. Now, the syntax looks very simple. This look very similar to arrays, but notice there's no length specified in the brackets. This is because the length is not known at compile time for slices. So when you the slicing syntax, as you probably have to tell, is very similar to Python or Go. It's just using the lower bound, colon, upper bound in there. So this Fibonacci is array of the, the sixth six Fibonacci numbers. Um, I'm going to slice from one colon to four, which means create a slice of elements one through three, including three. There we go. If you want to get the length, you just use the length of len operator again. And you notice you can also add slice literals and they're very, very similar to arrays. You just have to put the name in. Simple as hell. And again, these are all the slice operations. Very, again, very similar to, very, very similar to Python and Go. So you, if you're from those languages, you know what's going on. Dynamic arrays. Dynamic arrays are very similar to slices, but their lengths may change during compile time, uh, runtime. And this is because, they, as the name, they're dynamic. They also store a capacity and they can keep growing. And then they use the current context allocator that they've stored in the data type. So I can just declare a dynamic array of ints and keep appending to them like that. Absolutely wonderful. Um, most most um, like dynamic languages have these, but this is so much useful all the time. I just added it based into the language itself rather than making it user defined thing because it's so useful to have it there. Another thing, as I said, is that strings, effectively strings internally, are just a slice of bytes. Um, they're nothing special in that regard. And um, they just were like that. So you can also use the slicing notation to create substrings, like you say. So you can hear I've got a hello, and then I'm taking the slice of it for the first five characters. And look, I get hello at the end. Now, if I put the len operator, the uh, len function, sorry, on the on that substring, I get I get the length in bytes, not in ca um, code points or runes, just in bytes. This is for many reasons. Um, then if you need a null terminating string, there is C string, which is very useful for foreign libraries. But if you're dealing with just Odin, I recommend you don't ever need to use it. So the next thing we're going to talk about is the if statement. So the if statement is, um, the one of the easiest simple control flow things. It's very similar to how C does it, but notice that you, there's no need for the parentheses on the conditions. Um, just drop them. I didn't need it syntactically, so keep it clear and simple. And you can do easily just if, if else, if condition else. And for each condition, it also requires the curly braces. It's not like in C where you can just omit it. You require to say there is actually a, st a block statement here. You can also declare a variable in this thing, which is very useful when you're doing things and then you're checking it and you don't want to bring it into another scope. Um, I think the latest versions of C++ have this now as well, but it's, it's very, very useful. Um, the next control flow in Odin is the for statement. Now in Odin, there is only one loop statement and that is the for loop. Now it looks very similar to C's again. Look, it's like, oh wait, which is the same. But in this case, notice there's no parentheses surrounding it. So you just have the three components, the init, the condition, and the post. There we go. And that's a typo. Um, with no plus plus, it's actually plus plus one. Sorry, that's a minor typo there for me. Uh, there, and then unlike um, other languages like C, again, we don't need the parentheses, we can then start emitting all of the different things that goes on here. So if we can drop the inner post, we can do the comma, the semicolons. And they're like, oh, we can just drop those semicolons. We don't need them. So now we've got a while loop, which is actually just called four. And then if we drop out the condition, oh, we've now got an infinite loop. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. The for loops can also be used for 
uh, other data types. So we can do we can loop across an array and just put that in there and get the the values of the array, or we can get the values in the index, or we can just get the index by just putting an underscore and ignoring that value. We can also iterate over across a range of numbers. So instead of having to do the C style um, loop, we can then do just a range, do it over like things to do that with ellipsis there. We can also do it over strings. And in this case, Odin assumes that the string is UTF-8 and it will do so like that. Uh, the next control flow is the switch statement. So in C, switch statements are effectively jump tables. They're very usually useful to have. But in Odin, they're a little bit more clever. So again, as we saw with the um, if statement here, we can declare a little simple statement and then check it afterwards. And notice there's no parentheses needed at all. Very simple. Now in Odin, we can do the, oops, go back. We can do a case check here. And each case creates its own scope, which is absolutely wonderful. And not just that, it implicitly breaks at the end of that case. Unlike in C, you would have to do an explicit scope and explicit break. Most of the time, that's what you want. If you want to fall through, you can explicitly fall through. But most of the time when people do fall through, through is to do multiple cases because you can easily do that and they're just common separated on the case. You can also do um, ranges of case. So now this is an inclusive range, checking the value from five, including eight, so five, six, seven, eight. Mm -hmm. You can do explicit breaks within a switch, as it's obvious. You can also do exclusives. This is 10, up, including 18, but ignoring 19. You can also have cases with non-constant values. So if they have non-constant in that case, it will just treat it as if this is a if-else chain and go in that order. And finally is the default case. And in this case, it's called case with no options. That's instead of like C or you have the default keyword, just case in this case, done. Case in this case, so many words. The other control flow statement in Odin is the defer statement. Now, the defer statement defers the execution of a statement until the end of its scope it is in. This is extremely useful in so many cases. So this is akin to scope exit in um, D, for example. Uh, so for instance, here, I've got a little piece of code example here. So it's declare a variable called x, sign to one, two, three, defer the printing of that variable to the end, which is the end of the scope. We create a new block where we will, at the end of that scope we'll sign it to be four, but then we'll sign it to two. And if you notice, if we print this out, we get the value to be, uh, well, the value will be printed, we get the first printing will be four, and the next printing will be two, three, four. Now note they go in reverse order. So if we did pr defer print one, defer print two, defer print three, it'll print three, two, and then one. Okay, so basic data type, structs. So structs, Odin has structs, so that's fine. And again, it's following the same syntax and sense. You've got the name and then type and then the comma separated. We can declare them with like compound literals here, like so, or we can assign the, the fields manually. We can also take uh, the reference of these variables because they're just variables like in C. And if we want to assign through a pointer, here as well, we can do. We can do it explicitly, so do dereferencing and then get in the field. Or Odin's clever enough and goes, you know what, most of the time you don't need to do that um, dereference, we'll know it's a dot. So it just does an implicit dereference here for you. So this means you don't have to use the arrow syntax like you do in C. Um, and this is very, very useful for when you are refactoring code as well, that you're changing something from a pointer to a value or vice versa. And you don't want to actually really need to care if it's one or the other. And talking about all the semantics of structs, if you don't initialize a variable, it will be initialized to the zero value by default, unless you explicitly tell it not to, um, or you can explicitly give it another value to assign to. Uh, this is done because we're taking advantage of how many, many modern machines will zero memory effectively free for you, um, especially if you do in many different cases. Uh, but that's for a different presentation for another day to explain how that works. So questions many people will ask is, is Odin an object-oriented language? Because it's got structs. And the answer is no. It's, it's just data structures. Data structures are just data. They don't have behavior in Odin. There's no methods. Okay. Hopefully that answers all your questions for that. Right. Next data type is the union. So Odin has discriminated unions, which are called tagged unions or some types in some of the languages. And by default, their default value is the nil value, obviously. So everything is usually nil or something like that. 
In this little code example, I have a value type, which is a union, and it can take on the values of either a ball, an I32, an F32, or a string. So when I initialize, it will just be nil, so it'll be none of the above, but it's just nil. So I can then assign it a string, and that will become a string. Or I could assign it a ball, and it'll become a ball, or whatever, and so forth. I can check to see what the type is through what's called a type assertion. And if it is not that string, it will panic. And just say it'll just kind of panic in that case. If you want to check it without panicking, you can do an explicit OK in here. And this is called the OK, comma OK idiom in, in Odium. So you can do this and this won't panic. Now, if you want, by the way, if you want um, C style unions, you can do that through the struct type. You use struct and then raw union after it hash raw union. And then it'll just treat it as if it's like a C style union because they are effectively just a form of struct. Um, in uh, Odin as well, there is also the type switch statement, which can be used in conjunction with unions. So instead of just having to check if it's the type assertion, you can just do a big switch statement on it. So in this case, I'm now getting a value and switch the V in the value, so the value in the V in the value, and checking the type again. So in case we do the string type, or the Boolean type, or we can do the um, the I32 or the F32 cases. We can do multiple cases of types, or we just do the default case. So the default case is usually when it's nil, or even if the value's been corrupted somehow, and you just want to do the, the error check for that case. So notice each case has got its own scope. So therefore, now the value of v will be a particular type. So in the first, in the case of string, the type of v will be a string type. And the type of, in the case of the ball, will be a ball type. Variable. But in the case where it has multiple, it cannot infer which one it should be. So it will just treat it as if it was the original value. Okay, simple enough. Another uh, thing that Odin has is uh, enums. Very simple. They were very C-like in this case, but um, the difference is, is they are scoped. So in that case, they instead of being declared when you declare the, net, the fields of the enum, they're not put into the global namespace. Uh, you have to access them through the name of the type itself. Mm -hmm. You can also set the values of the enum themselves if you want. Holes are valid, like in C, you can just sign them to any number. Mm -hmm. And also you can set the size of it as well. By default, it'd be an int size, but um, you can also say this is a U8 or a U an I16 or whatever you want it to be. It's fine. Now, enums, are very, very useful. There's a feature that I added to make it so much nicer to use enums, and I call these the implicit selector expressions. So instead of having to write, say, foo.a, we can just write dot a. And then it'll infer, because Odin has a very good in type inference system, it'll go, okay, this is meant to be for a foo type, you can figure it out. In fact, you can do it on the switch cases so you can avoid repetition writing foo.a, foo.b, foo.c, you just write dot a, dot b, dot c and it will figure out what it's meant to be. It's very, again, very useful to do. Another thing to note as well on switch statements is by default, they will, it will ask for every single ca um, case to be taken. So every single enum case or every single union case, whatever. If you don't handle it, it will tell you off or it'll tell you to put a flag on the switch, say, okay, this is a partial switch statement. We're not taking all the cases. Um, another type, which is actually from old languages such as um, Pascal, but it's extremely useful as well, is extending the it to the bit set. So a lot of the time we use enums for flags, but what we really wanted was something to actually denote a flag type rather than just overloading what the concept of an enum is. So with Odin, we have bit sets. These are kind of mathematical notations, so each bit is representing a different value. So in this case, we've got a direction set. So we can say we've got an enum of north, east, south, and west. And then we're creating a bit set we call a direction set. And then we're going to create a direction set which contains a north and south in it. And we're going to say that check to see if dot east is in the direction set. Yep. But west is not in. And there's a not in operator here. Very simple. We can also have sets of numbers and runes as well if we want, as long as the range is fine. Um, like that, it doesn't have to be that. And also we can specify the size of this bit set because internally a bit set is just an integer. So if we want to say actually internally, it's um, a U64, even though this A to Z with only 26 bits, so that's a 32 bit integer, we want you to force it to be um, a 64 bit integer. There we go. Now bit sets have all the mathematical operations you have to hear if you want to just quickly breathe, breathe through it. You can do all the cool st stuff with sets that you'd normally be able to do. Notes that in Odin, the, um, the tilde here is actually the XOR operator, XOR operator. Um, so then, and also the not unary operator. It's just these in the same thing. So like and not is a very useful thing here. But there you go. 
another useful data type that's built into Odin is a map. Now, a map is a hash map or an associated array, you may call it. And the zero value map is nil. So a nil map has no keys in it whatsoever. Now, it's built into, into the language to be very, very useful because it's a very, very common data structure that you'll be using. So why not just allow the language to understand what this is? So simply, you can just make a procedure here. This just initialize it with the allocator for the current context. And then I'm doing the defer statement here to delete it after this scope is done. You can assign to it like this. This is the assigning syntax. And then this is the receiving syntax to read what the value was. So the, the key and element, this is to insert or update an element. And then the other one is to retrieve. Now, if the key, this is a weird, this makes sense. It makes sense because I'm trying to make the zero value useful in the language. If you um, if the key doesn't exist, it will return the zero value at that location. So if you want to explicitly check that that entry exists, you can do the comma OK idiom again, or you can just do key in M, so which is the in operator, like same with the bit sets. Also, maps have um, support for literals as well, so you can make it look very clean. Hey, who needs to have all of this um, dynamic language? You can have it in a statically typed language. Next is procedure types. So in Odin, instead of calling functions, we say procedure because um, it's a bit more technical and a bit more old fashioned, but Odin has first class support for procedure types, but these procedures are not closures. So because it's manual, manual memory management, we are not gonna have closures in the language for numerous reasons um, for that plain reason, but they are so, they're very easy to read. This is a procedure that takes a, uh, an int and returns a bool. This is a procedure that takes a procedure takes an integer ball and outputs two other things, so an, um, an i32 and f32. So this is an example of a name procedure constant. So this is like a procedure declaration and it's called do work, takes in a value int and returns an int. So it just doesn't work on it. Great, x times two minus one. They can also take in multiple parameters and return multiple values. So Odin can take, return multiple values like it, very easily like so. It can also do named return values. So if you want to name them for self-documentation, these values will also act as if they are variables. So you just treat them as normal variables and then do what you need to do. So as these examples, because it's multi-valued multi language, you can then just do this in here. So you do multiple values. Procedures also can name the arguments. So instead of like just C, um, C's like compound literals where you can specify the field, you can do that on procedures as well. Very nice and useful. One interesting thing about Odin's type system um, is that types are distinct. Um, so all types that would not, again, we said there's no implicit conversions going on. This is because of the distinctness stuff. When you declare normally like a, a type here, it'll be an alias. So like if I did int alias colon colon int, that's just the same type, just to give it enough the name. But if I say, oh, no, no, my int distinct int, this means these are completely different and they will not uh, coerce with one another. So for instance, here with this variable here, i int one, two, three, we can pass this to anything that's got the int alias because they are effectively the same type. But my int, oh no, no, that's not allowed. That would be an error. And that's because it's a distinct type to it. Even though it's underlying the same thing, they are distinct from the compiler standpoint. The next are, again, aggregated types, for instance, structures, unions, um, enums, all those and stuff will always be distinct. Um, so the foo will be different to like an the thing that doesn't have it's the same structure internally but different. This is because you very ever rarely, if never, want a named anonymous type, like aggregate type. It makes sense when you're using it. It's one of those, it felt right kind of things. And it really did. It was a lot of um, experimentation to get that correct. Now, Odin supports so many more features. I won't cover all of these. Again, we have UTF-8 support, full support. We have parametric polymorphism, which is many people call generic, on both procedures and record types, so structs and unions. We have the using statement, which I will cover. We have extensive support for custom allocators, which is simple to use. So you can have memory arenas, regions, pools, stacks, and so much more, which is very easily added. You've got the implicit context system, um, which can be used for allocations, logging, thread data. The whole purpose of this was adding was just so I could intercept third-party code when it was doing all allocations and logging and wrap it to see what's going on. Um, and many of, again, the built-in types like the dynamic array and the map take advantage of this context system. There's also the extensive runtime type information. This is what package font is a great example. Like you can just pass the values in and it will know how to print them correctly. And you can even do proper formatting and it just, it's extremely useful. That's the whole reason I added it is to get a type safe printf. 
There's endian specific types. So you can actually specify like an integer or a float is little endian or big endian. Um, very useful. And again, I said there's size boolings, which is very useful for dealing with foreign languages. Odin has explicit procedure overloading, which is um, pretty much next taking the concept of um, C9, C11's generic and applying it to how you actually want um, procedures to act. There's also the foreign system mode, which is interfacing with foreign languages, and it makes things deal with so much easier. In fact, it makes it so you very rarely even need to write any linker flags ever, because it actually deals with it, all of its um, minimum dependent system. It's very, very useful and very wonderful to use. So to cover some of the other features in the language, there's the using statement. Now, using brings different entities declared in a scope or a namespace into that current scope. Um, and this can be applied to not just import names, but struct fields, procedure fields, and even struct values. This is, it's very powerful and it's a thing. And in some cases you could think this is similar to Pascal's with, but Pascal's with is scoped. This is saying the current scope it's in. So it's kind of some of this is a lot more, more powerful than just Pascal's with. So let's take a very basic example here. I'm defining an entity that has a position in it, which is a vector three, which has the fields X, Y, and Z. And I'm having a procedure that takes a pointer to that entity. And I'm just going to print out all the values of that position. So entity.position.x, y, and z. Now, I'm going to give you four different examples of how to write this in a clearer way using using. Yeah. So the first case is we can just say in the scope, add a using to the entity. Now, this means we are now using the entity, which is a live pointer as well. So we are actually, and they could do position.x, position.y, and position.z, and that's live, that's amazing. We can apply the using to the field parameter itself, or the, the procedure parameter itself, so we don't have to create a new line, make it clear. We can also apply it to subfields of that entity, so using entity.position, and that will work. And we can also apply using on the declaration of the, of the field in the struct itself, so we don't have to do it everywhere, we can just do entity.x, entity.y, and entity.z. This is extremely useful, and this can be um, used to actually implement a form of subtyping into Odin. You can also use it to change the memory layout of things, and it will feel like it's exactly the same, but you've got so much power. This is no other language out there available today for the average public can do this and have that much control out of memory layout without changing the usage code. Um, if you want to hear some more examples about how powerful this, just ask me afterwards. Uh, the next um, very big feature in Odin is the implicit context system. So every scope, there's this implicit value called context. And the context is variable effective. It's local to each scope. And then it's passed implicitly by pointer to any procedure in that scope, as long as it has the Odin calling convention. And this is useful for passing along thread information or uh, allocators or logging logs or whatever, so on and so forth. And if you follow through this code example, it shows you what's going on, changing the context, changing what value goes on and so on and so forth. And you can see what happens this value gets passed along. For instance, in this, this block scope here, the user index is only set in that scope. And again, we change the allocator, and then that scope chooses a different allocator. So we're nearing the end of this presentation now anyway, but Odin is missing a lot of features, such as object orientation or interfaces, trites, type classes, operator overloading, implicit procedure overloading, language support for concurrency, even though there is actually core library. There's many things, but it's extremely powerful because it's taking the idea of procedural imperative programming a lot further. And many of these different ideas I don't think that they, they come at a higher cost when you're trying to do things and try and tell you how to do other things. So I was trying to nudge away from these ideas. You can still do object orientation if you'd like, manual like you could in C, but in fact, you can do it a lot nicer than you could ever do in C you know, with Odin. Um, again, there are some other experimental features and advanced types and advanced types like, for instance, the when statement in Odin, which is the compile time if statement. There are bit fields. So these are much more uh, advanced things. So you can sign various things. There are SIMD vectors, which are literally vector types, which are specifically registering to SIMD um, instructions. There's the autocast operator and also the transmute operator, which is a bit cast. There are um, structure of array types. So you can specifically say that the layout of this array is a structure of array. Instead of being um, an array of structures, it's a structure array. If you want to read more about that, it's very, it's very nice and cool and interesting. It's an experiment feature. Odin also has auto relative types. So these are like a pointer that is relative to its own memory address. So it's actually an integer type internally, but then it points relative to it. So this is very good for serialization or keeping the memory usage down. 
And there's also an experiment thing here, which is mainly added for COM API stuff and also um, Objective-C stuff, is that you can then effectively call a V table and pass its parameter in just by using the arrow in syntax. So this is, again, very useful. Experiment. That's why I added it. it was a, there was actually many use cases across many different platforms. I went, okay, this is very useful. So there are many people using the Odin programming language at the moment. Um, one of them is JangraFX, which is the Embergen. And now Embergen is real-time volumetric fluid simulation for film and games. And as you can see from the demos here, they are pretty damn cool, and they're in real time as well. These aren't just pre-rendered. These are they, these are pre-rendered, but they will be running in real time using the application. It's using the power of the GPU. Now, Odin is the main program language for the interface for this, and it's been helping help them be more productive with the language and building these tools. So try it out. Um, Odin is an open source project, and we welcome those contr contributions from the community. All contribution, contribution, contributions are welcome. Um, so if you want to find more information, please go to the website, which is odinlang.org. Um, you can even go to the official Discord where you can get loads of live support and talk with other lovers of Odin. So thank you for listening, and I'm Ginger Bill, and any questions? Okay. Okay. Let's start off by uh, giving Bull a, a round of applause. Thank you very much. That was a great presentation. Um, feel free to unmute, guys. Thank you very much, Bull. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'll just let's start with the Q and A now, I guess. Yeah, I, I would suggest if someone has a question, um, just indicate in the in the chat, and then um, a ball you can uh, pick someone up to answer a question. I see that there is already one question in the chat already. Yes. So the question is: um, Does Type ID work with dynamic languages? libraries and the answer is no so this is actually a really complicated problem and the answer is it's not very easy to solve so type id is something that's local to that uh, kind of compilation unit and it's recommended to keep it there so that it don't pass type information across those compilation boundaries um there's not much things okay any other questions i do have one question um, yes, please do. You mentioned with the strings and runes that they are signed 32-bit values. Yes. And I remember back at the Handmade Seattle talk as well, during the compiler chat, you mentioned that as well there. And there was some very small detail about it, but you didn't go into details exactly yes. why it's signed and not unsigned. And Yeah, I'm just wondering if there's a reason for that. Um, there's actually a few reasons. So I actually prefer signed integers by default, like always. Um, because if you do, because you can sometimes, you know, it's very common in operation in C, is you actually you can subtract two um, characters together to figure out the difference. And if it's unsigned, it will wrap around and you've got actually the wrong value you wanted. You actually want it to be the right arithmetic. So you, signed is more the default value for things. There are also other things is you can actually encode other things, like for instance, negative values um, of different code points, like an, an EOF can be negative one if you want it to be. Uh, there's many different reasons to have it that way. Um, it's very, if you want unsigned things in general, you can be explicit about it. I default to signed. Thanks. I do have another question. Uh, yeah, go ahead. About, um, I mean, there are parallels to this language and the uh, Jonathan Blow language. And I'm wondering about the uh, compile time execution stuff that um, he raises, and he raises it as a significant part of the language. Um, I'm wondering, like, it seems like there's not too much of that here. Um, is there a reason for that? Do you have a... Yeah. yeah, there's actually a very good reason for that. Um, it turned out I never actually required it as part of the core language library as well. It's the core language itself. It's also a really big cost language because it actually complicates a lot of things. Um, if you have a language which has out of order declarations and then put in arbitrary compile time execution, you've got a a lot of complicated things now to deal with. The language becomes a hell of a lot more complicated. You also have to have a, um, a virtual machine inside as well to run everything. Um, you're also then adding more costs that people just use something thing and actually it makes compile times longer because it has to calculate what's going on. I'm not against metaprogramming. In fact, I absolutely love metaprogramming. But the difference is I want there to be a separate stage in my building. So Odin already has um, in its core library, again, a parser for the Odin language itself. So you can pass the Odin language and generate other stuff if you need. Eventually, it will have the entire Odin compiler as a core library. So you can just import it as if it is a library. And 
things just magically work in that regard. And you just build your own meta programmers that way. Um, because if you have one built into language, it's never going to please everyone. So I just, I, I made a design decision and went, okay, I'm not going to do this. Just on that point, um, does that mean that in the future, there'll be a time when you can write a program? I mean, I guess you can do it now by um, writing a program that runs the Odin compiler on the command line to set all of the different compile options. Um, but with that, I guess, based on what you were just saying, that will become a library that you can just call. Yeah, many of these things would just be libraries. Like, for instance, you're built using Odin as a build system. You can do that already. You can do that in C. Um, you just need to have C call the... The, the, the compiler run the parameters it set be done instead of using bat, like batch or make file or python or whatever you can just use any other language at the moment this is not unique to any language um yeah uh, firstly um i just want to say it's a really great talk Thank you. Um, yeah did you play around with, because uh, I know like Rust and stuff, there's lots of things with like expressions and returning expressions through scopes and stuff. Did you play about with that idea and what sort of benefits and negatives do you see about that? Um, so Rust is a very interesting language anyway, and it has many big ideas to it, which I don't necessarily agree with, nor think they've been proven. But Rust is effectively, um, part. I would say it's part of the ML family, like um, this is ML, like it was Haskell would part of that, where everything is an expression in the language. And because of that, everything is an expression. Everything starts being built up from that. Odin, there's very things, some things are expressions, some things are statements, some things are declarations. They're actually quite distinct what those concepts are. They don't just make everything, everything could be an expression. And this is by design because I wanted to keep those concepts separate. It also, is because Odin has different concepts which are incompatible. Like for instance, Odin has um, expressions where they can be um, multiple values. That means not just one or many, it can be zero, one, two, three, four, whatever you want. In Rust, everything, or even in C in fact, everything is singular valued. So everything has a value, even if that value is not, is got a type of void, like it has no nil value or whatever. So Odin's semantics are actually quite different, and I find the multiple um, term value is a much useful construct myself. But as you were saying in the different scopes, like you can do an if as an expression, or you can do pattern mashing. Most of that doesn't even make any sense in Odin. It doesn't actually make sense as a construct because of the language semantics. So, so I'm guessing that's the reason why you don't have void then. Uh, it, it doesn't make any sense yeah. in Odin. It literally, because it can have an expression that has no value. So it doesn't have a type. It has no value. Only values have types. Hmm. Um, well, I had a, a question. You mentioned that um, Odin's really been used in production um, by Embergen. Yes. And uh, I'm assuming that uh, Ajanga affects most of the developers there were like C or, or C++, uh, from a C or C++ background. Yes. Um, uh, how did how did the team find transitioning to to Odin and um, um, it pretty damn quick? It was less than a week. Most people got used to it, much less oh, than a week. In fact, yeah, that that is quick. Well, is there is there a feature that's that's commonly cited as like being someone's favorite? Do you, do you hear like a lot of there? Everyone has their favorite. Seriously, um, I've never found the feature. For most people, they just say, okay, this feels like a much better C. It just feels better to use. Some people love the bit sets a lot. Like it, it sounds like the most minor thing in the world, but they love it so much. Some people love the context system. Some people love uh, even default parameters and procedures. Like can't do that in C. Um, there's, there's so many features that they're all, everyone has their favorite because it's one annoyance that person had with another, mm -hmm. like they had in C. And ev everyone's different in that regard. I just can't yeah, I, say there is a one feature thing. Sure, uh, that makes sense. I, I think something like uh, Andrew was saying in chat earlier that the uh, untyped constants, I mean, I, I don't think I've seen that anywhere else. I think that must give the language a really like smooth feel without having to like um, add like explicit suffixes or, or like casting unnecessarily yeah. when you know what you kind of need. That's really, that's a really cool feature. Um, it's interesting because you mentioned um, obviously uh, Pascal and um, so uh, that and Rob Pike as influences, and I see there's also some um, some Jai influences. I think probably the 
in contact system being the and the using that kind of uh, stands out. Um, were there any um, any influences that are kind of like um, that most people wouldn't have heard of, or or, or something at the end that we don't really know about? Um, there's loads of different things I've borrowed from loads of different languages, and some of them are just com completely forgot where I've got it, the exact thing from. But some of them, like no, um, I, I know like the bit set stuff is just a set type in Pascal, which has existed since the seventies. It's nothing new. It's just it's been forgotten. Right. And it's it, it, but again, as I said, some, someone it's one of their favorite features, is along with the implicit select syntax. And the sli implicit select syntax I nicked from Swift. Um, there's again, I, there's loads of different things, and I'm like, okay, I really like that approach and see if it works in Odin. If it doesn't, I just chuck it out. If it doesn't, oh, wow, that works amazing. Uh, the using syntax, uh, like again, you say it's from Jonathan Blow's language AI, it's effective, as I said, it's just Pascal's width. When I saw it, I originally went, oh, that's Pascal's win. Went, oh, no, it's slightly different, but it's got nicer semantics and you're applying it to all of the constructs. I went, that's a clever idea. Or, for instance, the context system, when I saw that, I went, that solves a bunch of problems that I've had when interfacing with third-party code. And it does. It, that's the reason, I think it's the main reason. Because if I wasn't worried about third-party code, I would just have explicit parameters to procedures, but it's good. Also, I found until about a few months ago, I realized that the context system can be used to actually get a form of um, closures in the language. It's the, very dodgy, but it does work because it's implicitly passed. You can pass extra state in if you need to. So it's very clever. Um, but it's, I'm trying to think of the language features that I talked about. Um, again, the constant system was a, he a heavily modified version of how Go's done it. Because um, I noticed it in Go, and I was like, oh, that's very clever. But then I went, mm, I need to make it feel right because it wasn't working as well as in Odin. So I had to get a lot of experimentation there. Um, the package system in Odin, that's technically from Modular 2, um, uh, which is Nicholas Viet again. Nicholas Viet again. Um, and I modified that slightly by adding the package collections, which if you've ever used C before and you're in including something, you've got like the print, uh, the, 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 the the speech marks do a relative import or the angle brackets to, to do the um, absolute import, which is defined thing. Well, the thing is when you do the absolute import, you don't actually know where it's coming from when you're actually reading the code. In Odin, the way I made that is you to be specific where it's looking from, which is the package collections. I nicked that idea from Dart. It was just ingenious how it came up with that. I went, that solves a bunch of problems. And I went, yep, that's brilliant. Um, so it, loads of languages have good things. I went, okay, that's good, that's good, that's good. Some of the stuff have came up myself, some of them haven't. I'm like, okay, these are interesting things. Some of them are pure experiments. Some of them, but most things I have honestly taken from languages from 20 or 30 years ago, most of it, because they've shown they've worked or they've worked, but people have forgotten about them or um, we know what how they behave. I've not tried to be extremely experimental here. I've, I've been trying to be as... Mm -hmm shown how it's shown its worth i, hey, I think you mentioned oh, sorry oh, go on. sorry and no, 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 you go i'll take a break for a while okay um yeah so i i can really see how there's so many features which you kind of can maybe just about work into other languages but here it's just they're easy to use with no friction yeah and it's um it ju just uh yeah it doesn't doesn't grind you down when you're, when you're trying to shovel these things in the way they don't quite fit and um yeah go back uh also wanted to comment that it was a great talk so and, and thank you for yeah. thank you for giving it um one question i had was around the uh built-in array and map types particularly maps. yes um so you mentioned that um you can uh, give them a custom allocator. Um, yes. Now, particularly with a map, there are lots of different ways that you could implement one. Um, yes. How is it? Have you given a defined version, a, a defined implementation of, of maps that has to be followed, although with certain <laughs> allocation options, or or is is there some flexibility in in how? The so map works? this is one thing apart the specification. I haven't really defined I'm, i might make it vendor specific like vendor defined but the way i've kind of defined it at the moment is pretty simple and also very easy to iterate across all of the entries um and it's done that way on design because of the allocation schemes you could just pre-allocate a certain amount of capacity 
And then just, there's a very useful thing. You just put the nil allocator in there. It's like a special allocator and it just does nothing. So if it tries to reallocate, it doesn't allocate, just nothing to it. So it's a very useful thing to have sometimes. And then you can just have a fixed size map and you don't need to reallocate. Because the allocation strategy it does is the way I've done it, it's just meant to be simplicity to work for most allocator systems. So all it does is if you want to resize, it creates a new allocator, copies its stuff into it and deletes the old one. Um, because not all allocators um, are designed to re, um, resize in place necessarily. So I was trying to design that way around. And again, with you said the dynamic array types as well, if I go where are those this week, dynamic arrays here, they're quite simple internally. They're just a pointer, a length, a capacity, and then the allocator. And then when it resize, it calls the allocator. In fact, that's not defined by the type, but it's defined by like the append procedure. So you could actually change the functionality yourself if you wanted to. The internals are defined, but the um, actual implementation of how it grows is up to you. Sorry, just to go back go back to the map and um, slightly. If, say yeah, if no, no, abso to, absolutely. Um, if you wanted to change it from from like a, a linear probing to a uh, a bucketed system, or if you wanted to have um, oh, I don't know, if you wanted to make sure that the pointers are stable or something like that, um, is is that something that a user could change, or is that um, so? Currently in a, those a particular thing? cases, I'd recommend just writing your own data structure. So Odin yeah. does have like parametric polymorphism or generics, if you want to call it that, um, and it allows you so you could actually just make your own map type if you wanted. It may not look like it's not the same as writing map and the same syntax, but you can get it pretty close. So if you need a specific layer, like maybe it needs to be an ordered map, it needs to be. Um, something where it, it has to be kind of based in a tree rather than it has to be buckets and stuff like that. If you need a specific, very specific thing, fine. This is just the average everyday yeah, case, yeah, yeah. like 8% of the time, this is what you want, maybe 99% of the time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, again, sense. if you want something custom, I highly recommend just writing something custom. Yeah. Uh, and so you you wouldn't get the the slight advantage of the, the nicer syntax, but it's it's not a huge, a huge no. loss there. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Um, yeah, I have a quick little question on uh, the. So you have no implicit casting whatsoever uh, at all on on. Sorry, from casting from like a small integer to maybe a bigger integer, maybe. In yes, because they are different types and they're distinct types. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, because I think Zig does it from a small. They only allow you from small integers to big integers. Yes. And then if you use something like Rust, it doesn't allow on anything. So and the slice, when you, when you do the slice index, or the index operator, it wants you to use a use size. So you have to cast stuff up all the time. Right. Manual. So in this particular case, that's a good point. So yeah, um, Zig allows you because the. The value representing it can be represented by a large thing, so it will allow the implicit cast. But no, I'm saying no, no. The type is distinct, so do not allow it. Not the type conversion. For Rust, as you're saying, yeah, it does very explicit, and it tells you how to make sure you've got the right parameters to each thing. It's like if you're doing slicing or stuff. In Odin, for like if you're putting a key into like an index for a slice or an array or and do the slicing, it doesn't actually care. It just hopes it just wants it to be an integer type. It just wants you to be an integer type that you've passed in there. It doesn't have to be a specific sized. And that does, sounds like, oh, you're doing an implicit cast. I'm like, actually, I'm not doing any casts. Yeah. I don't need to do a cast. I just need to ask you, pass me an integer. You can sign types as well, like C. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I default to sign in, in Odin. Yeah. Everything is signed by default. Oh, fair, yeah. Yeah. yeah so if useful. you need to sign, you can explicitly do it, but I always recommend using signed. Signed in the extent is great. Like, yeah. just stuff still before the pointer is, yeah. Cool. Uh, okay. Uh, I had two more quick questions. Um, the yeah, one go ahead. was about, um, about the fur. So I know that there's like a gotcha in, in Go that if you um, if you run the fur inside of like a for loop, um, it doesn't actually end at the for loop scope, it ends at the, the function scope. Um, the defer yes. in Odin, is that, is, would that like work inside of a for loop? Yeah, so it's, it's scope based. So Go's approach yeah. for defer is function exit minus scope exit. So in, Go, right. in Odin, it's scope exit. Go's is function exit. And the, the reason why it's done for that way in 
go is mainly it's due for two reasons one it's for the garbage collector and one is for the panicking system so in pa when it panics the, all the defer procedures get called then you can recover from it so that's one of the reasons for its design it also it's because um you can do uh, it, it defers it only allows to call a procedure so doing closures and keeps adding them up Odin went, look, we don't want any of that. Just do it scope. And because 99% of the time, you actually want it scope based. You don't want it function exit. And right. um, function exit requires you doing or literally allocating loads more memory to actually store it on there. So that's the reason why I did this approach. It's also effectively being, it's like if you lose C, there's like RAII, which is resource acquisition is initialization. Um, this is instead of being type based, this is just statement based. And it's a lot nicer. In fact, there's some other features which are more advanced, which I won't talk about yet, but um, you can even make it work a bit more magical. So you can do like profilers, automatic profilers and be cool with all using defer. Yeah, that's really cool. I mean, I, I think scope base is what people implicitly think when they first see at a first day and what that's gonna do. And the fact that it is actually scope based is, is great. Uh, yeah. I've actually had this, I, I thought it was scope based and go and, and created a, a problem for myself once upon a time. Um, the other question I had is, I saw, you know, this is a good slide. Um, so you, you've got a core standard library. Um, yes. What is, the, what is the current state of the library like? Is it, uh, I mean, obviously you're writing it all yourself. So I'm assuming it's most pulled out in places that you have an immediate use for. Um, so it's, some of it's written by other people in just stealth, but yeah, a lot of it is, a lot of it is, you know, I wrote it because I'm out of necessity because I needed something particular. But some of the stuff I've added because I know other people have wanted and requested it. Um, one of the first things that I added was the FUMT package, which is to do a string printing and the OS package as well. OS package that currently is, is it will need to have a lot of my rework because we need to, it needs to be cleaned up. Because again, that's clearly one of the first I wrote and it was just, it was out of necessity, not out of thinking about every, everyone's going to use it. But some of them are a lot more clearer. Like for instance, we've got encode, um, encoding formats like for JSON. Um, you can do marshalling, marshalling in it. You've got um, other things like built-in utilities for like scanning text and doing that pretty useful. There's oh god, there's, there's loads in there as well. Like seriously, loads of utility stuff that you can use to help you stuff. And it's, some of it is very well, some of it's well documented. Um, some of it is um, and very useful as well to use. Again, it, it's not just a necessity now. It's more okay, what people are asking for. Okay, let's take that seriously into consideration. Okay, I, I lied. I have one more question. Is that uh, no, no, if someone wanted to contribute to Odin, um, what, what do you think would be kind of like uh, a useful thing they could do? Is it like, do you need help with documentation? Do you need help searching out the standard library? Like from your perspective as like the language creator and, and maintainer, like what would be useful to you for people who want to kind of get started contributing to Odin? Yeah, so for me, I'm like, all, all help is welcome in all areas. Seriously, all areas. Whatever you think you can help contribute in, please do. Be it documentation. Documentation is extremely useful, especially if the core library, because um, the more documentation, the better. And again, Odin has built-in stuff, so it has tools already can do Odin doc, and it will just generate the documentation, only in the text format at least, not HTML yet. Um, and you can just show you all the comments that are attached to that declaration. There's also... Um, other things we need doing, like we need people to just keep testing stuff like bug testers. We need people helping work out on the compiler a lot, uh, like compiler backend development was very, very useful, especially for the platforms. At the moment I'm working, trying to get Odin working on the new Apple M1 chip. So I've got myself a Mac mini and trying to do that as myself, trying to get that working. But other people have been trying to get it working on other platforms. I know someone was doing it. Uh, they got it working on FreeBSD the other week. Some got it working on uh, what other architecture they get. I can't remember. But yeah, there's different things we need help for to get other platforms like that. There's again, literally, however, help, even helping other people, helping write code examples, help up with the documentation on the website, helping with the website itself, which is open source. Everywhere, um, help is needed. And I would be very much obliged to help 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 you help me out. <laughs> okay, uh, I assume kind of the Odin Discord would be the the best place to like hang out if you. If you had yeah, Odin Discord or... is absolutely the best place to hang out. Um, it's, it's very active there. There's usually very many people there asking questions, and being cheery, helpful, and yeah, just having a good time. Okay, awesome. Yeah, that's all for me. Thanks so much, Bob. No, thank you, Mike.
Do we have any more questions or, or should we kind of uh, move to the more informal format? And another quick question about the defer. Um, yeah, go ahead. Did, did I gather that it um, evaluates variables when the defer is executed rather than when the defer statement is correct? Um, it, where, where it is in the code. Yeah. Yeah, correct. Yes. So, a really good useful of thing about that is you can do like a defer an if statement. So, you can do defer if and then the conditions are evaluated later. So you can do con conditional things later. It's, there's many different things. Like it is an orthogonal thing. You can put any statement after you can add defer an if statement, defer a for loop, defer a, a call, defer, you can do whatever. And it, you can even defer like um, assignments, which means you can do it like a temporary thing, reassign and reassign to something else at the end. Uh, it just works. And it's extremely useful to do, yeah. And so if you wanted it to be evaluated at the um, at the place it is in the code, I assume you just put in a, a variable that you never change or something yeah. and, and defer it to that. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so I have one more final question. Um, Go ahead. How are you um, looking at integrating within like text editors and stuff? So because I've seen some videos of like what the sort of like the, uh, there's like, I watched the uh, person who made like the TypeScript compiler for some reason he wrote in JavaScript, I think. Anyway, um, but he, what, what they were saying is they basically um, they, they basically like have a different structure compiler to the traditional one, which I imagine you do the traditional side of things where you- uh, uh, Well, it depends on what you mean by traditional beer. You just pass the whole file um, and then sort of just, uh, well, it, it's really, really difficult to sort of understand what it was meaning by it. Um, it's kind of like, you know, when like you edit a bit of code and you kind of want to know what that function. Yeah. yeah. Um, when you want to know information about the uh, information about the function or the variables around the text cursor, for instance, the yes. way he sort of described it was in a way where it was, he sort of tells the compiler, Hey, I'm looking to get information about this thing. And then it will go through it really fast. And then for some reason, serialize it in JSON and send it over anyway, but yeah. And then send it back to the text editor. And then the text editor will um, give you the information back. I was wondering how you, uh, um, if you have any ideas around tackling the approach of um, text editor plugins for Odin. Yeah, so what you're, what you're describing there is what they, it's called like a language server. So there's language server protocols uh, as well. And what effectively that is, is the language server is a web server that runs in the background that um, calls the compiler and causes caches stuff about the state of compiler, which then the text editor talks over a socket to by passing JSON back and forth to call what's going on. Yeah. Now, it's a generic interface um, as well, so it has assumptions about how your language is going to work as well. So for Odin, it's actually going to be a little bit weird. Like there's certain things in Odin where like that would not work at all with, there's an, uh, with the specification because it's assuming a lot about how the language should work. And it was the language server protocol was also designed for maybe like web stuff, especially when it's like a web server. One of the things I've tried to make Odin extremely fast about is that you can I try to make it a very fast compiler. So you shouldn't need to have to keep caching in the background like in a web server. You can just compile it again. It'll figure out everything where it is. So if you need to know where everything is, you can just ask the compiler. It'll figure out where it is for itself. So the integration stuff in the long run will be part of the compiler itself. It won't be something special. It'll just be something you can hook in that way. Now, I'm not a big fan of language servers myself for numerous reasons I won't get into because I'll annoy a lot of people. Um, but they... They, they are quite interesting things in general. But someone in the community is actually working on one already. Like they just started working on one and they've already gotten some basic stuff going along. And it's pretty interesting. Like, okay, I've not even done this. They are just utilizing the, the parser that I built into the, co the core library and building yeah. it, doing it that way, which is pretty amazing impact. Um, so it's being written in Odin, the language servers in this case. Um, but there's many different things like that. Again, again, you just want ID integration. For me, I'm pretty old fashioned. The fact I just use a text editor. I don't even use any of the auto completion or anything like that. I just have the docs, sometimes just the headers or the docs on one side and then the code on that side. And I just deal with it because I find for me, at least that stuff slows me down. It's annoying as hell. I know a lot of people like to just code and like a, put a dot and browse what's available. 
I'm personally not that per- type of person. It slows me down. <laughs> yeah, it, it's kind of annoying when it takes two seconds. Sorry, you see results, and then two seconds later, you see better results. But you're already yeah. well operating the results there, and you're like, ah. Oh. <sighs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so... But yeah, fair enough. So you're basically going the approach of Odin as a library, integrate that as a plugin, and then go go to town. Yeah, pretty much. Yes, which is extending like the, the question that Mark had earlier, which was regarding like meta a compile time execution. Odin as a library, do whatever the hell you want with it, make your own custom compiler effectively, and then just do it. Yeah, it seems like another excuse to make the compiler more complicated by doing caching and whatever of uh, all those. Yeah, basically. Uh, yeah. Just doing like caching and recompiling certain files, and yeah, it was just another way to make it a lot more complicated than it needs to be of just simply transforming and yeah. Yeah. 